Hello, and welcome to the Feeling Good Podcast, where you can learn powerful techniques to change the way you feel. I am your host, Dr. Rhonda Borowski, and joining me here in the Murrieta studio is Dr. David Burns. Dr. Burns is a pioneer in the development of cognitive behavioral therapy and the creator of the new Teen Therapy. He is the author of Feeling Good, which has sold over 5 million copies in the United States and has been translated into over 30 languages. His latest book, Feeling Great, contains powerful new techniques that make rapid recovery possible for many people struggling with depression and anxiety. Dr. Burns is currently an emeritus adjunct professor of clinical psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine. (laughs) Hello, Rhonda. (laughs) Hello, David, and welcome everyone who is listening to this podcast, wherever you're coming from, this is the Feeling Good Podcast, and it's episode 328. And today we're going to have a very special guest. I was just thinking the other day, how can we get Jill Levitt back onto the podcast in 2023? And we're so excited to have her. Jill's the director of training for the Feeling Good Institute, and she's also you know, the incredible co-trainer in the Tuesday group, the Stanford Tuesday group that David runs. Um, on teaching beginners and more advanced people, everyone who wants to come about Team CBT. So we're honored to have you, Jill. Thanks so much, Rhonda. I think of you guys all the time too, and I'm super excited to join you. Yay. I have just I... have to second Rhonda's statements. It's just a joy uh, whenever we work together, with the exception of last Tuesday, <laughs> which I screwed up the Tuesday group royally. And I'm feeling ashamed, which is the topic of our yeah. podcast today. Yeah, the but topic of our perfect. podcast is shame, right? We're, yeah, we're going to have some fun, too. Good. Good. Okay. Well, I thought I would start off by just reading one brief endorsement. And this endorsement is about episode 309 which we published on September 12th of 2022. And it was on the topic of loneliness. And we had a special guest that episode to Mark Noble. And someone wrote to us just briefly, I just finished listening to podcast 309 and I found it extremely helpful in starting to change my own thinking about my chronic loneliness. Thank you so much. Cool. Yeah, she didn't want to leave her name. Okay, well, thank you for that kind endorsement. And thank you, Mark, too, for gracing us. I think that was at least the third time you've been on our podcast, always with a fantastic uh, message. So what made you guys decide to do you a podcast on the subject of shame? Um, well, I can get us started and say, um, yeah, so David and I have been um, working hard at trying to put together a workshop that we're going to be giving in February, um, where we're actually taking the participants kind of step by step through a, a beautiful uh, live work that we had done with a kind of beloved therapist from the Tuesday group many, many years ago named Melanie. And so we've been spending time um preparing the workshop and watching these beautiful and kind of inspiring video clips. Um, and the, the workshop is all about CBT for shame. And so we thought, well, it would be fun to share some of the ideas and, and wisdom and, and methods and things like that with your podcast listeners. Cool. And what yep. day in February? It's on Sunday, February 5th. Okay. We'll we tell can... you all about it at the end of t- today's podcast, but one of the reasons I'm excited about the the workshop is because the the video is is really mind blowing, and some people have seen little excerpt here or there from that Melanie video. But we're going to put base the whole workshop on on that video, and I think it's one of the most beautiful and amazing psychotherapy sessions ever caught on 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 video, uh, and it was also serendipitously filmed by two commercial television uh, people. So the the audio and video quality are just pristine, but Melanie's personality and uh, she's just an amazing person and her, her heart just comes shining through like, like, like crazy. And, and I think you're going to absolutely love the workshop and learn a tremendous amount. Uh, as well. I remember watching the segment that you did on that 
train on the work on the video on um, the double standard technique, and I watched that over and over again because it was so brilliantly done. With Angela Crom was on that too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, but anyway, let's get into the topic of of shame. I, I can kick it off with just a very simple statement that um, although shame doesn't get maybe as much attention as concepts of anxiety or OCD or depression or these kind of mainstream topics, it's incredibly painful and incredibly common. And in our Tuesday group at Stanford, we have maybe 40, 45 people there on a typical Tuesday night, all are mental health professionals. And Whenever we've pulled them, it seems that a good 80 or 90 percent of them do struggle with with, with feelings of shame. It's incredibly painful, and it can express itself in in, in a lot of ways. You know, the, the woman who will be featured in our workshop had struggled with nine years, more than nine years of incredible intense shame and anxiety, hiding something about herself that she that she didn't want want others to see. And so many of us uh, are like that, kind of hiding something about ourselves. Uh, you know, uh, the people in the Tuesday group are often secretly feeling, you know, I'm not good enough. Uh, I'm not smart enough. I'm not worthy enough. Uh, you know, I'm inferior. My skills uh, skills aren't good enough. And they're all totally convinced that if people find that out about me, they're going to judge me and look down on me. And it's kind of like living a double identity, like a, a spy or something. You have this persona you're presenting to the world and then this secret, uh, horrible life that you're hiding from others and learning how to help yourself or your patients totally blow that whole system apart and come out into the the light of day and the sunshine and experience love and joy it's really a a, a miracle to to do that for someone and and it, it's you're going to see in the in the workshop and in the video the transformation of the human spirit that can only be described as mind blowing or jaw dropping mm. wow that's you're making it so intriguing. Before you, <laughs> before you go into depth about shame, could you tell like what I'm curious? What's the difference between shame and guilt? They they seem to be cousins. Well, I'll blur blur that. I was going <laughs> to give you a chance to j- jump in there, uh, Jill. But you, you can use these words in any, any way you want. I mean, it's how you define them. But I think a very <clears throat> nice way to define them is that guilt and shame are both caused by your thoughts. And and when you're feeling guilty, you're telling yourself, "I'm bad. I violated my my value system. Uh, you know, I'm some. I'm not morally up up to speed." Uh, it, it's an internal cr- criticism. Shame, in contrast, is where, where you are afraid that others will judge you, look down on on you, uh, and be, when they find out that you're weak or that you've you've done something bad or that you've failed. In, in in some way. And I would say that guilt and shame are are both pretty equally equally horrible mm-hmm. feelings. And uh, you know, both both of them can be fairly readily treated too. Uh if you if you know the techniques, if you if if you know how to use the the team the team model, and that's what we'll be bringing bringing to life on uh February 5th. Yeah. So, yeah, I was thinking um, maybe one of the things we could start with is talking a little bit about what we call positive reframing, um, because um, it's while there's so many really powerful techniques, right, that we use uh, that we used with Melanie and that we'll be teaching in the workshop that we can talk about today, kind of no methods will really be all that effective uh, if the patient is is yes butting us, and in some ways it makes sense that we need to sort of honor the patient's resistance to change, right? By thinking a little bit about like maybe what are some good reasons to hang on to feelings like shame or guilt or anxiety or what are those 
painful feelings and thoughts show about the patient that's really beautiful or an expression of their value system, maybe we could share with audience a little bit about Melanie and a few of her thoughts and then talk them through a little yeah. positive reframing. Yeah, maybe we give a little exercise for our audience uh, right now uh, to uh, do a little positive re- reframing. Um and I just remembered we I, I wrote about Melanie in my book, Feeling Great, too. So mm-hmm. some of you may recall her from, from that book. But uh, she volunteered for a – do a video to demonstrate how Team CBT works. And I, I didn't want to use real patients because I thought that could be a – uh, an ethics vi- violation uh, f- for a variety of reasons. But in our Tuesday group, we often do real live personal work with the therapist. So I thought, I told our Tuesday group, we're going to have these two television people at, at my home on this this weekend and, and uh, or whatever the days were. And if you can come, if there's something you want to work on that you'd be willing to work on in front of the camera, then we could show how CBT works or how team CBT works. And Melanie uh, was one of the ones who volunteered and she was just a totally beloved member of our group and uh, just fantastic person, a a highly regarded mental health professional and teacher. And I couldn't understand why she, how she could possibly have anything personal that she needed to work on. And I think one of the things uh, that just startles me a lot, and, and if you're a therapist, if you're not doing the kind of testing we do, I think you're you're missing something could be a tremendous help to you because you don't know how people are feeling inside. The, Melanie looked like the happiest, most down-to-earth, successful person you can imagine, a loving, tremendous person, but she got in front of the camera and she began to 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 cry and and said that uh, uh, the upsetting event was a phone call from someone in in, in her congregation and uh, expressing condolences for the uh, death of her mother in law and and then and then she says and 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 dr burns uh, and she started crying and she said my my tears are not sadly for the death of my my mother-in-law it's for the the death of my ex-mother-in-law mm. and i had to tell this woman that and to tell you the truth dr burns i i i i'm in my third marriage i've had two failed marriages and i am so damn ashamed of that and I've been hiding it from nearly everybody, and it's been making my life miserable for the last nine, ten years. And I, I my 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 third husband is 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 fantastic, and we might be out with another couple for having dinner, having fun, and then suddenly I, I remember, oh my gosh, what if they find out I've had two failed marriages and they judge me? And she says, and my my heart sinks, and 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 it was so so sad to to hear, to hear to hear that, and and how she had been feeling anxious and ashamed, and her feelings were intense. They were up at the hundred out of a hundred, uh, in 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 severity. And um, now uh, there's a really cool thing that we're going to say next, and and mm-hmm. Jill will reveal what that is <laughs> yeah well maybe well maybe we can just list uh just now just list a couple of the feelings and a couple of the thoughts and then sure. we can all show sure. the, the listeners a little bit about how positive reframing works yeah right well she felt you know 50 percent sad 100 percent anxious 100 percent ashamed 95 percent inadequate about you know 80 or 90 percent humiliated and embarrassed uh she didn't feel real real hopeless as i recall only 25 percent there but and then she was about 80 percent frustrated and 90 percent angry she just had intense negative emotions and she'd been carrying that this whole nine or ten years and then she had many negative thoughts but she had a couple uh, like uh 
I'm defective, which she believed 100 percent. I'm I'm a failure, which she believed at a at 100 percent. And it's these thoughts and your belief in them that triggers these negative feelings. And then the thought that terrified her the most was she'll tell other people who will judge me. And she believed that one 100 percent as well. And then she had eight or 10 additional uh, negative feelings uh, that uh, she believed all of them at 80, 90, uh, uh, 100 percent. Yeah. And one of the things that I think, you know, uh, 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 that is kind of most mind blowing about your um, team CBT and the way that it works is that, of course, we have some really powerful techniques to help her and we're talking to her and listening to her. And of course, we're thinking in our minds, as probably listeners are, too, you know, wow, these thoughts are really distorted, right? I mean, having more than one marriage doesn't mean that you're defective and doesn't mean that you're a failure and um, and lots of people won't judge you and all, all sorts of things like that. But we don't rush in and try to help her and try to push our advice on her. Instead, we kind of take a step back and we're first thinking with her about, you know, what are what are good reasons for her to to feel these feelings and to have these thoughts? And even what are her thoughts and feelings show about her that are really beautiful and awesome, almost, you know, as you say, David, what her her negative thoughts and her negative emotions show kind of what's what's right about her, not what's wrong about her. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so maybe we could just um, show the audience a little bit about how we do that. Um, we won't we can, do we won't we won't do all of it for sure. We got to leave you uh, wanting more, but maybe we can just show them a little bit about how it works. Yeah. Yes. Right. And and I might say that this is one of the most radical things about Team CBT, uh, and its effectiveness is totally unexpected. You see, most therapists. We were trained to think that these negative feelings are bad, and the DSM, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association, even reinforces that by saying these are mental illnesses, mental disorders that that you have. And what we we want to do is, and and it feels that way too. Like when I feel ashamed, which is somewhat often actually, that I also feel oh. This is weird and bad to be feeling ashamed. I, I don't want anyone to know that I'm feeling ashamed because that's a shameful feeling type of thing. And mm -hmm. and so you gotta get a an intensification of your depression or your anxiety or your inadequacy because society is saying the, these are mental disorders. These are uh, th 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 these are things that are wrong with you. And we even tell people. Yeah, you, you have a chemical imbalance in the brain. Oh, God, that's a horrible thing to t tell someone. That's why you're depressed. Oh, my gosh, I have brain damage. Uh, and uh, or, or you have, a, you know, a genetic, uh, genetically you inherited this or uh, you had a have a personality disorder of some kind or some some de de terrible defect. And what we want to do is help the person see that it these things are actually the expression of what's most beautiful about you and your core values as a human being. Because the moment the person suddenly feels proud of their negative symptoms, paradoxically, the need to have those symptoms goes away. You explained this once. It's a very puzzling phenomenon. Um, but... I asked you, Jill, once, why does this positive reframing so effective? And 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 she said, because when you do it, you're finally listening to what your symptoms are trying to tell you, which, which is a very beautiful thing. And once you listen and hear, then the symptoms lose their need to, to exist. I thought that was a beautiful way. But let's bring this to mm -hmm. life in a practical way. Let's take one of her, her feelings. She's 100% shame. And she was not only 100% ashamed and 100% anxious, she was also pretty convinced that it would be impossible to eliminate those feelings. She thought they, she could probably improve them a fair amount, maybe get them from 100 to 40, but she was totally convinced that they would never disappear completely, and that's the hopelessness that magnifies them. But let's take shame, and we'll just pause uh, the, the podcast for, for a moment and and see if you can answer uh, three things about her 
shame or sadness or anxiety give you a choice of three feelings. So the first question you can ask yourself is, why might this feeling be totally healthy and appropriate given the circumstances that Melanie finds herself in? The second question would be, what are some benefits to Melanie or some advantages of this feeling? Like, how will my shame help me? How will my sadness or my anxiety help me? What are some benefits of them? And then the third and most mind-blowing question is, what do these feelings show about Melanie and her core values as a human being that's positive, beautiful, or even awesome? So why don't you just see if you can jot down on a piece of paper something really beautiful about her shame, her anxiety, and her sadness. What do these things show about Melanie that's not a brain disorder, but something pretty majestic, something pretty beautiful, something pretty appropriate? Mm -hmm. And what and is going to be helpful? Yeah, something real, something's going to be helpful for her. And if you can't do it, uh, if you can't come up with anything, just write down some nonsense, and that's the best <laughs> outcome, because then when you hear the answer, it'll suddenly make sense, and you'll have new brain circuits. But uh, see, see if you can come up with something. And what should we give them, like 30 seconds? Something no, they, like, can, they, they can pause. <laughs> they can just pause the podcast. Oh, yeah, yeah that's the way. Put it in their control. Going. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you can take five minutes if if, if you exactly. like. It's a great, great exercise, whether you're a therapist or a non-therapist. Um, and, and so, then, and then, they, and then we have to say, and then come back when you're ready to hear the answer. And now we can we can roll with some of our ideas. <laughs> yeah, I mean, welcome back. Uh, I hope you weren't <laughs> gone too long. It seems like no time at all from our point of view. Uh, so, what? Uh, let, let's uh, let, let, let's just talk about uh, an easy one first. She's sad. Uh, I wouldn't say clinically depressed, but she's unhappy. You know, on a zero to 150%, that's moderate heading in the severe range. But what is beautiful about Melanie's sadness? How could that possibly be a good thing? So one one idea, right, would be that it uh, shows what what that that she really values um, marriage, that it makes her feel sad to have maybe let herself down or let others down if she kind of values the institution of marriage. Yes. And, and it, it's in, in addition, it, you know, she's broken up with these two men who, who she mm -hmm. was married to mm -hmm. and she's still feeling some sadness about that, mm -hmm. which is, which is a beautiful thing. A lot of people get into this anger pattern of blaming mm -hmm. the other person, putting them down, trying to salvage your self-esteem by uh, denigrating s someone else. Mm -hmm. So common and so uh, destructive, incredibly destructive, and can go on for years or decades, ruin someone's life. And here she's allowing herself to feel sadness, which just raises my respect for her mm. so, so tremendously. Uh, so because, that, it that's, because it honors the past relationships that she was in, yeah. even if they didn't work out. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, how about uh, the uh, anxiety? She's anxious all the time. How could that be helping her, uh, Rhonda? Well, you know, her anxiety so far is keeping her vigilant, don't you think? So that in any situation, she's vigilant to make sure that um, she presents the part of her that she wants to present. Like when she's going out to dinner, yeah. she's carefully vigilant about, you know, not exposing things about herself that she doesn't want to do to the friends that she has with her first with her th current husband. That's that's tremendous. Uh, you were the first person I heard that from actually during the video, the actual session. I thought that was really neat, uh, oh. Jill. Um, can can you folks think of any other way her her anxiety is 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 helping her in tremendously? 
maybe it, it keeps things hidden. I mean, uh, this is sort of piggybacking on what Rhonda said, right? It protect if she's anxious about other people judging her, then she's not going to tell them about the three marriages. Sure, it sort of protects her from other people's judgment. Sure, but that's right. But what I'm thinking is on a different level. Although mm-hmm. that's fantastic, what you both said. But um, is, is she anxious about fouling up her third marriage? Mm. I would guess she would be. Yeah, and is that a good thing? How is that going to help her? Well, it would help her stay on top of things and and be more and be and work on the relationship so that it is successful. Yeah, and uh, yeah, exactly what she's done when she she was just raving about uh, how much she loves her her third hu- husband and how much she's learned and how beautiful her life has become. And I talked to her just recently. And uh, which is a good 10 years later or something. Hard to believe, isn't it, Jill? <laughs> totally, yes. Yeah, and, and and she says they're still still doing doing great. And, mm-hmm. and so there's another benefit of her, her anxiety. But how about her shame? That's a bad one, right? There's nothing good about shame. Mm-hmm. Right, Jill? Yeah, well, I guess, I mean, similarly, one one function of shame would be that it, it, it keeps her kind of hiding and keeps her protected. That's like a, a benefit of it. But I think what it shows about her that's really beautiful and awesome is what she values, you know, that that she um, has like high standards, you know, and and uh, values the institute of marriage that she values what other people think of her like what her colleagues think of her things like that yeah, yeah. i was thinking also that if she has a spiritual moral mm-hmm. value regarding marriage and the choices that she's made yeah her shame is uh, an expression of her spirituality mm-hmm. um and uh, also uh M- melanie's accomplished a tremendous amount in her life but she is is very kind of humble mm-hmm. and 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 down to earth that's one of yeah. the really lovable beautiful things about her she's so kind of person you want to give a hug to or hang hang out with mm-hmm. and uh, that that i think the the shame uh, and the feeling of inadequacy are also uh expressions of of those beautiful qualities that that she has and when we're doing positive reframing we're actually you see it's our it's my idea it's our idea that these positive aspects of so-called negative feelings is why people resist treatment and and resistance is the common most common cause of therapeutic failure that the therapist is trying to help and that causes the patient to fight and resist it and resist and we're going in the opposite direction and we kind of become like melanie's subconscious resistance and verbalizing all the really good reasons not to change not to give up the shame the anger the anger is a good one too because uh, she's maybe a little angry about how judgmental she thinks people are going to be, and 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 that that's a kind of a good good thing to be anger about. That's good anger. Uh, mm-hmm. There's some politician who died, a black senator or something, he talked about good trouble or something like that. Oh, John Lewis. Yeah, John Lewis, right. And and uh, so that that anger, that's kind of like good anger. That I was raised in a Christian church and saw a lot of judgment of people who you know had been divorced or something and you know becoming less less than and and so when when we and 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 it's right to be angry about about those things that's healthy anger and then and and so we're trying to get the patient to instead of press a magic button and have your symptoms disappear to to see the ver the the power and value of all of these symptoms now why i'm 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 a little slow to learn now why exactly do we want to get the patients to be proud of their symptoms instead of ashamed of their symptoms why is that well well for a variety of reasons and maybe we can tell them what comes next but i would say for for 
Right. For one reason is what you mentioned earlier, that we don't need to feel like we have our symptoms. We don't need to feel our symptoms and then also shame about our symptoms that we're feeling doubly awful. And so there is some mood elevating effect, in fact, right, Uh to to feeling kind of proud of our symptoms. Now we can just look at our symptoms alone rather than our symptoms plus our shame or our distress about our symptoms, right? Uh And the other thing, though, is just this piece of resistance, which is that if I, the therapist... I'm trying to convince my patient to give up their symptoms. Well, just it's human nature. They're probably going to argue back and fight for why they should hang on to their symptoms and kind of yes, but me. Um, But on the other hand, if I can actually kind of honor their symptoms in a very authentic way, right, in a way that's totally true and sincere, not not sarcastic, not BSing them very sincerely. Um, honor the voice of their resistance. And then and then what we usually do is we ask the patient, you know, given kind of all of these positives and all of the benefits of your shame and your guilt and your depression, all the things these negative thoughts and feelings show about you, that's really beautiful and awesome. Mm, why would you want to change? Like, what, why would you want to work with me on this? And And then the patient, assuming they want to change, then argues for change, right? And this is a very different dynamic than the therapist arguing for change and the patient resisting. If the therapist kind of honors the voice of the patient's resistance, it then puts the patient in the role of arguing for change, which is awesome, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that was a, that was a beautiful first step. What should we talk about? Um, And you'll see us doing this type of thing with Melanie uh, on the, on the video. Um, should we skip the uh, process resistance piece? And, yeah, and, I think and, we could go to, you know, the double standard or let's define terms, externalization of voices, feared fantasy, yeah. any of those. Sure, let's do it. Well, so what, what, once we eliminate the resistance, the, uh, uh, you know, we're skipping important parts, the testing and the empathy, which is super important. We'll be going over those in the workshop too. How, how do you empathize with, with, with someone? What are the do's and don'ts uh, to form that real deep bond with, with your patients? And empathy is not going to cure them, but empathy certainly opens the door for, for powerful techniques, as does the, uh, the positive reframing we just illustrated, but then we we have all these techniques for challenging. I'm def- the thought. I'm defective, or I'm a failure, or she's going to tell other people who, who who will judge me. And we always take one thought, the thought she wants to work on first. And we put it in a what's called a recovery circle, and then select ten or fifteen t- techniques to challenge that that thought. And in the old days, it used to take 10 or 15 techniques or more, uh, like the downward arrow technique or examine the evidence or externalization of voices or, you know, whatever, and fail and fail and fail until you you find the one that works. In the more modern era, and the reason we're seeing these amazingly fast recoveries now is because of the positive reframing, because often the first or second techniques we, we try uh, – blows the negative thought out of the water and brings people to a a state of intense recovery very, very rapidly. So should we talk about what? Yeah, uh, let's try one. Yeah, so. What would you like to demonstrate? um, Well, it's all, (laughs) it's it's all good. Um, I'll let you choose. Okay, let's do double standard. Okay. And let's, I'll set it up if you want. And let's mm-hmm. say, um, let's, should we maybe just pick one of the negative thoughts to start with? Like, um, I'm a failure. Sure. You want to try that one? Yeah. So, uh-huh. so basically I'll just tell the audience the, the double standard technique is a really wonderful kind of compassion based technique. And the goal of it is to help the patient who generally feels compassionate toward others to kind of channel that compassion toward the self, right? It's based on the idea that we have a, that the patient has a double standard where they're kind and compassionate and and loving toward others, but but really hard and self critical on the, on themselves. So it's um, a good method for someone like Melanie, who we could see, you know, had a beautiful heart that she turned toward others, but was being really hard on herself. And then it's a role playing technique. So in this in this um, technique, uh, David 
I guess I'll call you David um, or Melanie. I don't know. If I'll I be know. Melanie. Yeah. Okay. That'll be easier. I'll call you Melanie. So in this, in this method, Melanie, you get to play yourself. So you're just going to be Melanie. And I can just be Melanie. Exactly. <laughs> and I'm going to be a dear friend slash clone of yours. So what I mean by that is I'm someone that you really care about, a dear friend of yours. Um, but I'm actually a clone of yours. So I grew up in the same family that you grew up in. I um, have had the same you know, strengths and weaknesses, the same trials and tribulations. And I'm, again, I'm, I'm going to kind of talk to you about what's going on in my life and what I've been telling myself. And I'm going to, uh, you know, ask for, for some help. Um, so before we start the method, Melanie, um, what is your name in the role play? Who are you? I'm uh, Melanie. I, I don't, can't remember if I'm the negative what? or positive Melanie. Nope. You, there's no negative and positive. You're just Melanie. Oh, I'm just uh, Melanie. Double standard. You're just you're just Melanie. And then Melanie, who am I in this role play? Do you remember? Yeah, well, you're M Melanie, the a friend of Melanie's. Right. I'm not Melanie. I'm just. Oh, a, oh you're a friend a, of Melanie's. A, a oh, dear okay. friend. Uh, slash oh, a dear clone. friend. Oh, are you okay? You're the right. Melanie clone. Exactly. Name Jill. Melanie. Right. Okay. Um. So should we give it a whirl? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, um, Melanie, could I talk to you for a minute? Oh, sure. I'm your, I'm your dear sure. friend. And yeah, I've been really um, suffering quite a bit, actually. Um, you see, I, I, you, you probably know this about me um, already, but, you know, I've had, um, I'm on my third marriage um, and I'm also a therapist and, uh, you know, I, I, I really do think that I should kind of have my act together and I keep telling myself that because I'm on my third marriage, because I have two failed marriages, that means I'm just a total failure. And I'm, I'm wondering, do you think that I'm a failure? No, I don't think about you as a failure. You've, you've had failed marriages. I think we've, we've all had lots of failures in our lives on, on many different levels, but you've also had a ton of successes. And I just, kind of love you the way you are you know I, i'm not busy here judging you or thinking of you as as a failure i i don't even know what what a failure is you've failed but i don't know what a failure is you're you're a pretty successful lady and and because you've had some failures i personally feel a lot closer to you Wow, I I love what you're saying. Actually, it's so touching to me. You're you're telling me that I've, it's true that I've had some failed marriages, um, but that I've also had a lot of successes in my life, and um, some failures, some successes. But you're also saying what what on earth does it mean to be a failure? That that doesn't seem to make any sense to you, right? That there's that there's successes and failures, but that wouldn't make me like a failure as a person. Um, yeah, that's right. In fact, it seems kind of mean. It seems belittling to to call you a failure, it's like bullying or what the schoolyard yeah. bully does. Uh, right. I, I I guess you're right. And and you also said something else. Like you feel closer to me actually because I've had some failures, which is a a kind of a cool idea. But are are you just saying these kind of nice things because you just like want to make me feel better? Or do you, or do you really believe what you're saying to me? Well, it's really true because um, you, you, you've had a lot of awards. You get awards from the mayor and from all kinds. You've got all these awards uh, for all these civic things that you do to help people who don't have resources to get mental health care. You're a fantastic teacher. You run a, a you know, a, a postdoctoral program of some kind or, a, a, you know, a, internship for uh for social clinical social work students and you're amazing and it'd be pretty easy you, you you're the head of counseling at a local college and be pretty easy to feel intimidated by you but uh when when you share with me that that you've had some failures that you're hurting inside that, that that's what really allows me to love you and, and and to care about you and to feel close to you and to feel relaxed about you 
Well, man, right. you were you were the right friend to ask. You've been so helpful to me, and I I guess I would ask you, Melanie. Now I'm kind of back to Jill again. If what, what you just said, which was really so incredibly powerful, I thought if that was true of me, and I'm a clone of yours, which means I'm exactly like you, then that would be true of you too, right? What you just said would be true of you too. Is that is that right? Yeah, uh, I guess it it, it would follow. But you're yeah. not suggesting I could say those things to myself, are you? Right, right. Well, I am. I'm saying if these things are true of me and I'm a clone of yours going through just exactly the same stuff and you told me that you weren't just, you know, blowing smoke, this was actually true and you really believed it, then these would be true of you too. And so we can kind of pull out your daily mood log and we can write. I, I can tell you all the things you said. If you can't remember them, I was writing them down. And and the, those would go in the the positive thought column, right? And we could you know, um, rate them. So we'll do a timeout now, David, back to yeah. you. Know, that that was sort of a demonstration then of the double standard technique, right? Yeah. And I thought you did you brought that to life beautifully, uh, Jill. I think that was really neat. Well, thank you. And, um, and obviously David was playing the role of Melanie. So for the audience to know like that, that, might have sounded like David, but that was not David, the therapist, you know, trying to cheer up Melanie. That was Melanie, right, in the role of trying to tell her dear friend how she might treat her. And then at the end, we bring it to closure by kind of saying, well, if, that, if that's true of your friend and your friend is a clone of yours, then that would be true of you, too. And that's the way we can kind of help the patient to see that all of those positive thoughts that they generated are are, are you know, thoughts that relate to them as well. And then I'll oftentimes give people homework to kind of review right like review those positive thoughts um on their own and to even practice doing the double standard the kind of what would you tell a dear friend of yours throughout the week yeah um that was that's nice and of course we'll be going over a lot of these techniques and giving the people in the workshop the chance to to practice them mm -hmm. uh and, and um uh, because we make them look real easy, but it takes practice to learn how to do these things skillfully. One of the, the keys that we're doing with all of these techniques, like double standard technique, fear and fantasy, uh, externalization of voices, positive reframing, what if technique, uh, experimental technique, uh, survey technique, and on and on to smash these thoughts like I'm defective or she'll tell others who will judge me. One of the, the goals, uh, one of the neat things that you'll actually see in the Melanie video is the magic of acceptance. And acceptance is, is one of the deepest uh, aspects in therapy. It's been talked about uh, for 2,500 years at least, and people still don't don't get it, uh, and, and people fight against, I don't want to accept the, the fact that I've had two failed marriages, because that, that's something awful about me. And, uh, and the odd thing is, when you come to accept your symptoms, your failures, they turn into the opposite, and a new self comes in, into being, and uh, and acceptance i've often said is the greatest change a human being can make and that's a paradox because we think of acceptance as no change and giving in to a second rate life versus change you you go after making yourself better and you turn into this special person who's going to be happy and actually acceptance is that change and the giant within you the tender person as well emerges and, and you'll see that in, in Melanie, the what a mind blowingly powerful and beautiful woman she is and how that change happens. And roughly, you know, I think it was two hours and 20 minutes we worked with her from start start to end. And, and you'll you will actually see a miracle happening. Uh, on the video before your very eyes. It sounds so dorky because they just had 60 minutes uh, Sunday night. They had had something on the miracles at Lourdes or something like that. But I think when people's lives are transformed, that that is also a, a kind of miracle, but it's not based on on religion, but on techniques that you can learn uh, to to heal yourself and to heal, to heal your patients. And that's what we're going to be going to be doing on 
on February 5th. David and Jill, is this workshop that's dealing with shame, is that for therapists only or for anyone who wants to come? Anyone who wants to come is welcome to attend the workshop. It is focused on therapists. Therapists can get continuing education credit and um, there'll be exercises that are kind of designed to teach therapists how to do these methods with their patients. But the general public is absolutely welcome to come and will probably, you know, would probably pick up on some helpful techniques to practice on themselves as well. How are we doing on time here? How are we doing, Rhonda? Well, we've been 45 minutes. So we could keep going another few minutes so we could end soon. So I I have a thought, which is, I, I don't know, have, have you ever done let's define terms for your audience, David? Because I think it's kind of a fun one and very different than the role playing techniques. Yeah, sure. Let's, let, let's see, do that one. I could mm-hmm. see rolling into that one since you kind of moved us in that direction when you were talking about what, what is a failure anyway. Yeah. Um, do you want me to, to, we could set up and try to practice that one and then we sure. could, and then we could wrap it up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Would that is that is that cool? Yeah. Y- y- yes, and we recently. Uh, no, no, that's a good one, and uh, we recently tested this in the Feeling Good app in a beta test. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, and we set up for less defined terms and set up the five fatal flaws and. Oh. I, I procrastinated on quite a bit because I thought it would bore people and turn them off. And I said that huh. at the beginning of it uh, that yeah. you're probably not going to like this because it's kind of philosophical. But then it turned out to be very highly rated by the app users and very it, we saw significant uh, and fairly dramatic reductions in their d- d- depression. And and the idea behind the, uh, the, the let's define terms technique is, is that a lot of, you know, there's these 10 distortions that I described in my first book, Feeling Good, uh, that that you'll always find in the thoughts of people who are depressed or anxious or your own thoughts if you're depressed or anxious. And and one of them is uh, called labeling. And uh, that's where you label yourself as, as uh, she was doing as I'm a failure or I'm defective or I'm an inferior hu- human being. And those if you buy into that, and and most people who are depressed do, most human beings do from time to time. It's incredibly painful. Uh, you know, it, it's it's lurking behind social anxiety. You think you're not good enough. It's it's a key to depression. I think Rhonda, didn't you have something like like this at one point? You were like, I'm an unimportant person or something. Yeah, I'm not. I don't have any value. I don't matter. Yeah, r- r- right. And those those kinds of things. And and when when you use let's define terms, you prove to yourself that there's no such thing as a defective human being or an inferior human being, or there's no such thing as a failure. There's no such thing as the opposite. There's no such thing as a success. You say, well, Elon Musk, he's a success. Well, he just lost, you know, $80 billion in, a, in a, about a month or two. Uh, and so we we're all humans with successes and failures, but there is no such thing and and as a a, def, a defective human being, a, a loser, a failure. So you take your your label and then you ask five questions. Uh, uh, so um, uh, uh, about it, um, uh, you, and you can show that these labels have one of five fatal. Flaws. Either the label is true of all human beings, or it's true of no human beings, or it's non just nonsensical. It doesn't even it doesn't make sense. And then there's two other fatal flaws. Uh, well, those three are good enough uh, yeah. for us to illustrate it. So, should we give it a give it a shot? Sure. And would you like to be the therapist this time? I'm happy to do it either way. Whatever you'd like. I don't know. I thought you were doing good. I like your therapy. I'll, I'll continue to be a patient. I don't get to be a patient okay. very often. <laughs> okay, great. And then if you have any tweaks or you want to do a, you know, you want to do your version, that's cool too. Um, sure. Okay. Well, I'll, con- so- I'll continue to be Melanie. 
Yes, exactly. So you're Melanie. Yep. And mm -hmm. yeah, Melanie, I just want to try uh, another method, a very different method with you. Um, it's called Let's Define Terms. And we're just going to try to get clear on the definition of this word that you've been using. You've been telling yourself, I am a failure. And so I wanted to ask you, when you tell yourself I'm a failure, what what I'm trying to figure out, like, if you're a failure, well, maybe I'm a failure, maybe my brother's a failure, like, what, what's the definition of a failure? Okay. Um, and, and listeners, whatever I come up with will explode the definition. So I'll just, well, maybe a, a failure is someone who fails all the time. <laughs> uh, well, so... In that case, for me, David, I would say, can we, we, I need you to come up with a definition that doesn't use the same word in it. So a failure is someone who fa makes a lot of mistakes or what? Oh, well, let's do a role reversal. You give that definition to someone okay. who fails all the time. Okay. A failure is someone who fails all the time. Yeah. Now, what percentage of human beings fail 100% of the time? None of them. Okay, so you're saying there's no such thing as a failure. Do you have any other definitions in mind? Because I, yeah, oh, but that, this is the adversarial. I'll let you be the no, therapist. That's, okay. that's better style, better style. But yeah, um, so that's nonsensical. But I'm. Uh, how about uh, a failure? Is is someone? I'm thinking a failure is, is someone who fails uh, some of the time. Right. No, I would do what you did. So, so, um, well, I'm just curious. So a failure is someone who fails some of the time. So, um, do you know anyone who doesn't fail some of the time? No, I think everybody fails some of the time. So if everybody fails some of the time, then we're all failures. Is that right? Well, that doesn't make sense. Uh, so, we could all put on like, I'm a failure buttons and we could all just yeah. hang out and be failures together. Right. Okay. Well, how about well, this? I was now, wondering, David or Melanie, mm -hmm. actually, if mm -hmm. I, I might say, I'm, I think you're saying I'm a failure because I have two failed marriages. Is that what you're saying? Okay. Because in that case, maybe you're saying a failure is someone who has two failed marriages. Is that right? I guess so. Because in that case, I would ask you, so if, if, if someone has, um, if someone has been married only once, and they're, you know, horribly abusive to their spouse, does that make them a success? Whereas if they were to get divorced and then have another marriage, they'd suddenly become a failure. Does that does that sound like the right definition of a yeah, failure? That, does, that doesn't make sense either. Um, so yeah. I'd, I'd say good, right. good for you for getting divorced. Right, exactly. So essentially, I would I, we would continue to do this, as you say, David, until we figure out that, like, this idea, as we did, applies to, to everyone, like everyone makes some mistakes or fails some of the time, or it applies to no one. Like if you said you fail all the time, I yeah. would, we would wonder if you failed all the time, or it doesn't make any sense. Like this more recent one, like a failure of someone who has two failed marriages, like exactly two failed marriages, boom, you're in the failure bucket. Yeah. You know, that wouldn't make any sense. And so you use, it's sort of the art of the method is right. I use my you know my thinking to sort of get one step ahead of you and and sort of point at the illogic but i usually do it in sort of a friendly and try to be interested and curious and like explain this to me kind of fashion and eventually what happens is what happened which is you kind of go well that just doesn't make any sense right yeah and then yeah. i usually just say to people at the end right well if if this label that this failure label really truly no longer makes sense to us like it has no meaning then my suggestion might be like, let's, let's think of talking to yourself in more specific terms. Like you could say I've had two failed marriages, but, but that doesn't mean that you're a failure. Right. So we'll do away with the yeah. label and instead yeah. just kind of be specific. Yeah. I'm a human being who fails and yeah. sometimes succeeds and I can learn from my failures and I can learn from my successes, but there's mm -hmm. no such thing as a failure or what's the difference between saying, I'm a defective human being versus I'm a human being with, with defects. Right. And That's to me, difference. there's just an enormous world of difference as I get older. Totally. I'm, I'm beginning to see myself as kind of a, a, a bundle of defects. And it's sad, as, as you know, when we get old. Um, but uh, does that mean we're, we're, we're defective human beings? There's a kind of a cruelty behind depression right. and anxiety. 
and we're you're just lovable. trying to. You're a lovable bundle of defects. As Thank, you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Well, anyway, that just gives you a few, uh, uh, a little idea of the kind of things we'll be doing in the uh, w workshop. And uh, if you really want to learn uh, Team CBT or powerful techniques to bring about rapid changes in depression and anxiety, shame and inadequacy, loneliness, embarrassment, humiliation, hopelessness, and anger, come come to our workshop. Uh, we'll, we'll have a lot of fun. We'll be grateful to see you there if you come. Uh, it's it's on um, Sunday, February 5th, and it's from 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Pacific time. And for therapists, there's uh, seven CEs. And then also I should mention it's if you if you want just more info about it to learn more about it and to register for it, um, the web address is www.cbtforshame.com, and that's CBT and then F O R shame.com. Yes, and just so you know, we're not just out for the buck. We, we I do two paid workshops a year. I used to do over forty days a year of paid workshops. Mm -hmm. And so it's down to two. So it's a kind of a rare opportunity. But um, if if you object to money, and, and I do most of the time, uh, Jill and I and Rhonda are offering unlimited free weekly psychotherapy training in the Tuesday group at Stanford and then Rhonda's Wednesday group. We have people from all over the world. And so there are some requirements. You have to come to three quarters of the sessions and you have to measure your patient's symptoms at the start and end of sessions and, and use the team CBT techniques. But uh, we do personal work. We we meet two hours a week, sometimes two and a half hours a week. And we also, we cry and we laugh and we have a good time. And so you're welcome to to join us in those avenues as as well. That's a really great point to make that there's additional training available to people. It sounds like in this in this workshop, you're focusing on shame, but people who come will get a flavor of the entire model of team CBT. Absolutely. That's right. Yep. It's really, it's, um, and we really were, we're going through the story of the personal work with Melanie, showing them these video clips of a variety of different kind of moments in time, different methods that we use. And shame is only one of the feelings. So it's really shame, depression, anxiety, guilt, um, a whole bunch of different feelings. But yes, we'll get an overview of actually the whole team CBT model. That's awesome. Yeah. All righty. Well, thank you so much, Jill, for joining us. It's always a joy. It's Thanks always fun working me. with you, Rhonda. Yes, it's always uh, a pleasure. You know. I'm pinching so myself that we're still here. You know. Okay, see you next time. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. This has been another episode of the Feeling Good podcast. For more information, visit Dr. Burns' website at feelinggood.com, where you will find the show notes under the podcast page. You will also find archives of previous episodes and many resources for therapists and non-therapists. We welcome your comments and questions. If you want to support the show, please share the podcast with people who might benefit from it. You could also go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski, the director of the Feeling Great Therapy Center. We hope you enjoyed this episode. I invite you to join us next time for another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast.